You can now find all of C-SPAN's nonfiction-focused podcasts in one place, the C-SPAN Bookshelf feed. Follow now, and you'll get all of C-SPAN's podcasts that are nonfiction book-related every week. I'm Shannon. And I'm Rachel. And as part of the podcast team here at C-SPAN, we wanted to make it easy for our nonfiction book lovers to access all of our offerings in one place. Hear from authors like Kadada Williams on her book, I Saw Death Coming, Joan Biscubic and her latest, Nine Black Robes, or Neil King, who shared his walking journey from D.C. to New York City in his book, American Ramble. Featured programs will include Book Notes Plus, Q&A, Afterwards, and About Books. You can follow the C-SPAN Bookshelf feed wherever you get your podcasts. On About Books, we delve into the latest news about the publishing industry with interesting insider interviews with publishing industry experts. We'll also give you updates on current nonfiction authors and books, the latest book reviews, and we'll talk about the current nonfiction books featured on C-SPAN's Book TV. Well, in this edition of About Books, we'll sit down with former FBI Director James Comey to talk about his new legal thriller and why he decided to try for a second career as a novelist. But first, here's some of the latest news from the publishing world. The publishing industry had some good news in the first quarter of 2023. During that time, book sales rose over 3% compared to the same time period in 2022. The largest increases were in digital and audiobooks, which saw a 15% increase in sales. As a point of reference, nearly 800 million books were sold in the United States last year. And speaking of audiobooks, according to the latest data from the Audio Publishers Association, audiobooks revenue grew 10% in 2022 to $1.8 billion. That's the 11th straight year of double-digit growth. Additionally, a new survey found that 53% of U.S. adults say they have listened to an audiobook, and that's up from 45% in 2022. It translates to nearly 140 million Americans. Two new books that are helping to drive sales right now are David Von Drehle's The Book of Charlie, Wisdom from the Remarkable Life of a 109-Year-Old Man, and Fox News Judge Jeanine Pirro's latest Crimes Against America, The Left's Takeover of Our Republic. Both are on current bestseller lists, and you'll see both books featured on Book TV in the near future. And one other piece of publishing news, author Salman Rushdie, who was wounded in 2022 in an onstage knife attack, has been recognized during this year's literary award season. The free speech group PEN America recently presented Mr. Rushdie with its Centenary Courage Award. And additionally, the British Book Awards honored the author with their Freedom to Publish Award. Here's some of what Salman Rushdie had to say in accepting the British Book Award. The freedom to publish, of course, is also the freedom to read um, and the freedom to write, the the ability to write what you want, to have, to be able to choose what you want to read and not have it decided for you uh, externally, and the freedom to publish books that ought to be published, um, that need to be published, and sometimes uh, are difficult to publish because of pressure from this or that group. Um, It's very important, I think, that such pressure should be resisted. And we live in a moment, I think, uh, at which freedom of expression, freedom to publish, has not in my lifetime been under such threat in in the countries of the West. Obviously, there are parts of the world where censorship has been prevalent for a long time. Um, quite a lot of the world, Russia, China, in some ways India as well. Um, But in the countries of the West, until recently, there was a fair measure of of freedom in the area of publishing. Now, I mean, sitting here in, in the United States, I have to look at the extraordinary attack on libraries and books for children in schools, Uh, the attack on the idea of libraries themselves. Um, It's it's quite remarkably alarming. And 
we need to be very aware of it and to fight against it very hard. I have to say it's also been alarming to see publishers looking to, how shall I put this, bodlerize the work of such people as Roald Dahl and Ian Fleming. I have to say the idea that James Bond could be made politically correct is almost comical. Um, I think that has to be resisted. Books have to come to us from their time and be of their time. And if that's difficult to take, don't read it, read another book. But don't try and remake yesterday's work in the light of today's attitudes. Um, I know that that room where you all are is full of people who are deeply committed to the principles of uh, freedom of publishing. And I'm proud to receive this award. I think I receive it on behalf of everybody fighting that fight. And now we turn our focus to a first time novelist, former FBI director James Comey had previously written two nonfiction books about his career and the state of the U.S. justice system, but he's turned his writing focus now to legal thrillers. Book TV's Peter Slen recently sat down with James Comey to talk about his novel, Central Park West. So James Comey, why a novel and why now? Why now first, because I was nudged over time by a former editor of a nonfiction work to try it and I resisted and resisted. But the farther I got from government service, the easier it became to think about crime and terrorism and espionage. And so I decided to give it a shot and found it addictive uh, and harder than nonfiction, but a lot more fun. Where did the storylines come from? My amazing spouse. My wife has great story vision and she throws stuff at the wall, as she says, over coffee in the morning. And she pitched this particular story and it sounded great to me. And then we fleshed it out and I set out to write it. So how much of this can we take is based on your experience at the Southern District and as FBI director? A lot is based on the Southern District. It's not primarily based on the FBI, my time at FBI, although it's informed by my knowledge of how the FBI works in investigations, but it's mostly inspired by my time as a mob prosecutor in New York, but also brought to the current day by the fact that when I was writing this, my daughter was the chief of the violent and organized crime unit in the Southern District of New York and trying a very prominent case in the same courtroom that I tried mobsters. And so this strange crossover in my life happened and it made it nostalgic, but also current to talk about the, what goes on there. So James Comey, when we see the character in the book, Central Park West, Nora Carlton, are we looking at your daughter? You're looking at really a combination of all four of my smart, strong, tall daughters, but it was inspired primarily by my oldest, who was, and still is, a federal prosecutor in Manhattan. And so it's a labor of love, really, to write fiction picturing my girls and trying to hear their voices when I write Nora. So her name is Nora Carlton. Her partner's or ex-partner's name is Nick. Was this a throwback to the Thin Man series? It was not. And it's funny, totally accidental, but it's been pointed out to me. And I say, well, maybe on some subconscious level, but not intentionally, Nora and Nick. So that's one storyline. Another storyline is about the murder of a former New York governor who was Me Too in the Me Too movement. Anything we should take from that from history? No, it's all fiction, but it tried to be inspired by actual events, but not about a particular person. I was explaining to someone that not every Taylor Swift song is about her former boyfriend. So not every particular figure is reflected in history. A lot of salty language. There's a lot of salty language in law enforcement. Yeah, it's part of the, the culture of law enforcement. And obviously this is about the mob too. There's a fair amount of cursing in Cosa Nostra. So when we get into the courtroom scenes, lot drawn on your experience there? Yes, in fact, some of it is drawn from actual trial transcripts of cases that I did. I had a witness who, when he was one of the world's great art thieves, when he walked into the courtroom to testify against mobsters, one of them mouthed, you're dead. 
and I didn't see the mobster mouth it, but I saw my witness change. And so I went back and got the transcript of what happened after that to try and get it exactly right. I had another, I had a defendant who was murdered in the middle of trial and found with a canary stuffed in his mouth in the trunk of a car. And so I've tried to draw on, to make this as real as possible, though it's fiction, by drawing on those sorts of things. Given your experience in law enforcement, would anything surprise you today? Well, a lot of the environment around the FBI in particular surprises me, but the court system and the way it operates, the rule of law is the same as it was 30 years ago when my oldest daughter was four years old as it is today when she's in her 30s and the chief of a unit in the office I worked in. Who's going to buy this book? I don't know. I hope a lot of people because <laughs> I want to do this for a job. I mean, it's fine to work at a law firm or some other place, but I'd rather do this, in, which surprised me. And so I hope people write it, read it and find it very real, taking you inside these courtrooms and these conference rooms without being teachy in a fun way, and that it makes people want to read the next one, which I've already written and is, isn't finalized, but it's out for loving feedback from my family members. So they see the first draft? Oh, yeah. Mrs. It's, Comey sees the first it draft? It starts with Patrice. She sees it as I'm writing it and is involved in that process, looking at a Google Doc on a regular basis, suggesting edits, giving me comments. I like to do it on a Google Doc, so then I can go through the stages of denial by saying, she's wrong, then stare at it and say, she might be right, and then I read it a third time, she's right. I don't have to go through that pain in front of her. And then once it's ready, it goes out to the five kids, and then it goes out to a circle of friends who know this world and who would delight in telling me I got something wrong, and I want that kind of feedback. Now, James Comey, those of us who have been in Washington have heard for years about rivalries among federal agencies, and those kind of play a role in this book. Yeah, they're a feature of all federal law enforcement, but especially in New York, where you have the FBI and the NYPD, right? Godzilla and King Kong, and you have the Manhattan DA's office, almost next door to the U.S. Attorney's office, talented people competing over the work, and I would try and describe it to those who didn't know New York. I said, it's like, it's like we're mortal sworn enemies unless we're living together and having a baby because we did a lot of task force work together, but we also competed fairly aggressively for the work. And it's at times dysfunctional, but it's also a source of creativity and energy that's, that's really remarkable when you're in the middle of it. Given your experience as a prosecutor, as an FBI director, would you make a good defense attorney today? I don't know. I was a defense attorney briefly. I was, uh, I found it difficult work. Thank God good people do it because the system doesn't work. But I, I struggled with it a bit, so I'm not sure. I'd probably be better today because I've seen more of the flaws in the criminal justice system just through sheer repetition. But it's hard work. I never had the terrifying experience of representing someone that I knew to be innocent. Instead, I was providing legal advice to people to try and get them the best result. It's still very hard. Kyra and Tony Burke, who are they in the book? Well, she is the uh, estranged spouse of the former governor, who is, as you said, was disgraced and is out of office, living in a penthouse along Central Park West. And I'm not giving anything away to say in the very first pages of the book, he's murdered and uh, suspicion falls on her a case that my protagonist, Nora Carlton, is not paying attention to, because that's a local murder case that the DA is handling. She's got a mob case going where she's finally gonna put away a really elusive mobster. But the story is about those two cases slamming together and taking Nora and her investigator partner, Benny Dugan, on quite a journey. Now, Nora Carlton, assistant U.S. attorney, early on in the book as well, the U.S. attorney is described as basically an idiot. Is is that a typical attitude toward your higher level bosses in no. federal law enforcement? No. There are a lot of idiots in all leadership roles, but in the main I worked for really good people, but I was trying to capture maybe some of the weaknesses that I had seen in U.S. attorneys. Obviously when I was U.S. attorney I had no weaknesses whatsoever, but it's a, all people are complex and I tried to capture that with him because as you read on you'll see complexity with him as well. What about politicians? Do they figure in Central Park West? Sure. There are some evil people in Central Park West who have chosen public service through political office 
and I try to paint a picture of them. I'm a little bit of a cynic about politicians. I don't mean to badmouth them on C-SPAN, but I tried to use them as sort of character foils here a little bit. Why was it important to you in this book to describe what the FBI or, or the uh, uh, Southern District building looked like, what the streets were like, what the courtrooms looked like? Because I want to take the reader into them and have the reader feel what it's really like in those places, what it feels like to walk up those steps, what the, the intimidating architecture does to a room in which you're trying to achieve justice. And, and I could close my eyes and feel and see those places, and so I wanted the reader to do it as well. Then, of course, even though I know these places so well, I went and made sure I wasn't missing anything. I counted steps. I wanted to make sure I had it right. One of the feedback from my editor at the publisher was, you have a little too much. This is an architectural digest. And so he whacked a number of my, <laughs> use a mob term, he whacked a number of my descriptions of buildings. I hope it's enough to bring readers in without overwhelming them. James Comey, the media also plays a role. And one of the things that the media does is they happen to know about an arrest of somebody and they show up and they're waiting. How, do, how does the district attorney use the media everyone, to their advantage? Well, everyone in law enforcement in general should use the media because you're in the public service, public interest business, and the way you communicate what you're doing and why it matters to the public is through the media. But there's a, an especially close, in my experience, relationship between law enforcement and the media in New York. I think it's a function of a number of things, including that there's enormous law enforcement organizations with lots of people that media members might be able to speak to, and the media is enormous and concentrated in New York. And so there are long-standing source relationships that used to uh, frustrate me when I was U.S. Attorney and when I was the director of the FBI, because stuff would get out in New York in a way it wouldn't elsewhere. And oftentimes when you're trying to do an arrest and not have a, not have a circus, word still gets out. I remember when we indicted Martha Stewart when I was U.S. Attorney, I was very keen not to have any pictures of Martha Stewart in custody with handcuffs on. Because the case was important, it had to be brought, but she wasn't the criminal of the century, and I worried that that would send a confusing message. And it took a lot of work to make sure that no camera person was given a tip as to where to be to see Martha Stewart in handcuffs. And you have never seen that photo. So that's a rare success in trying to push apart that symbiotic relationship in New York between media and law enforcement. Who has the advantage in a courtroom? Is it the prosecutor, is it the defense attorney, or what are the advantages on each side? The prosecutor starts with an advantage because she represents the sovereign. She's able to stand up and say, I'm Nora Carlton for the United States. And so jurors sitting there see the United States of America, a country they love and they're part of, embodied in this person. That's a tremendous advantage. But we built our system to counterbalance that with the burden of proof. The prosecution has to get to, beyond a reasonable doubt, all 12 unanimously, which is a very high burden. It's one of the things I try and show in the book. That's why truth and justice can be different. You may know something in your heart of hearts, but if you can't prove it to 12 unanimously, beyond a reasonable doubt, you will not have justice in that sense. And so there's a balance, and it, I guess it depends upon the particular courtroom and the particular people. Often the quality of justice varies in direct proportion to the quality of your lawyer, if you're a defendant. But on balance, we've done a good job of trying to counteract the in, innate advantage that the sovereign has in courtrooms. Does a defendant have enough advantages in your view? Yes. Not enough to be perfect. Our system is flawed because we humans are flawed. Innocent people get convicted in our criminal justice system at all levels, and that's a tragedy. That's why we should never fall in love with our system. But I think it's the best that there is, and we have shrouded the defendant in presumptions and protections that are designed to let the guilty go free so that we don't pay the cost of the innocent suffering. And I think we do a reasonably good job of that. Again, uh, race is an important factor in courtrooms, power, privilege of all kinds, doesn't stop at courtroom doors. But in the main, we have a very fair criminal justice system. Director Comey, I don't know if you did this on purpose, but in Central Park West, I took away from that that, hey, 
the mob, the mafia is still active, even though we don't hear about it like we used to. Yes, that's true. They're less prominent in two respects. They're less powerful than they were, say, 20, 25 years ago when they lost their major source of money and power, which was their control over labor unions. And so they're out there and they're actually losing power in gambling as gambling becomes more, uh, more regulated and run by the state. But they have power in drug trafficking and extortion in all kinds of ways. But they've gotten smarter and realized that if you stand in front of your social club in a $5,000 Armani suit, the FBI is gonna put your picture at the top of a bulletin board, and that's gonna be a real problem for you. And so nobody wants to be named the boss because that brings attention. And so it's almost a, a call back to the original founders of the families, right? The founder of the Gambino crime family, Carlo Gambino, died a free man for a few reasons. He lived a very low key lifestyle and he only talked about family business outdoors and when whispering to two people. That's a hard case to make. And so the, the mob got away from that. And I think a lot of ways they've returned to that. Let's bleed below the radar. It's not about ego. James Comey, by the end of Central Park West, did you like Matthew Parker? Yes. Personally. Yeah. Matty Parker is a defense lawyer in the case who's based on one of my closest friends, David Kelly, who followed me as the U.S. attorney in New York. And I tried to capture Dave's loving curmudgeonliness and some of his mannerisms. He's trying to do the right thing. He's a very talented lawyer in a difficult situation. And I have a running inner monologue that tries to capture my friend Dave. And so, yes, I began loving Matty Parker because I love Dave. And his wife tells me, uh, you nailed it. You absolutely got it. What about your wife, Patrice? Is there a character that reflects her at all? No, but the themes that are in this book are hers. I mean, I tried to really highlight the importance of family. We show in this book an arrangement that's fairly common between couples that aren't married when they have a child that I learned about from Patrice, who's trained as a marriage and family therapist. They nest, and so the young daughter stays with the mom, and the couple alternates on weeks staying at the mom's house. They nest. And she suggested putting that in. I thought, what a cool idea to show the family can be non-traditional, but also really good for kids. There's a lot of that in there. So people who know my wife will feel her presence in there, but there's not a character <laughs> that she's allowed me to base on her. Are you... And have you been a, a thriller reader over the years? No. I tried, but I found it... I can remember reading Thoreau's book, Presumed Innocent, in 87, just as I was about to become a, an assistant U.S. attorney. And I was lit on fire by the book. I thought, this is so cool. This is what I want to be, what I want to do. And then when it became my life, I really struggled to watch TV about crime or terrorism or espionage or read about it. And the reason is obvious, right? It was filling my days. So I'm not gonna go home and sit in a lawn chair on vacation and read about the things that are dominating my life. And so that's what I meant by, it wasn't until I got fired and then time went by, I did nonfiction after I was fired, and then it became easier to think about the work the farther I got from it and easier to write about it. And I think that makes sense. I didn't see it at the time, but that's, I was a nonfiction person, C-SPAN kind of person, loyal viewer, and then I've started to drift into a place where I've realized that I can tell pretty cool stories and show people places in the fiction world in ways that I'm freer in that format than doing it in the nonfiction way. So did the sequel get written right, right away, right after this one was finished? Yes. I mean, it's <laughs> my wife has such great story vision that... She's already trying to talk to me about book three, and I keep telling her, no, keep that in your head. I'm trying to talk about one, trying to publish two, and then we'll get to three. So yes, immediately, Patrice's job, my job is to write, her job is to start thinking about, so what might the next story be? Do you have another job besides being an author these days? I do, well, being a grandfather is the most important job I do, drawing chalk in weekday afternoons that I wouldn't have been doing if I was in the government. But no, this is, that I hope this works because this is what I'd like to do for a living. What time do you write? How do you write? Do you write, do you keep things online or do you have a computer disconnected to the internet? I write on a laptop. So I'm, I'm 
I often you start in a Word doc, but I quickly make it a Google doc so that Patrice can feed suggestions and comments and w as I'm working. And so typically, uh, it, the rhythm is she's reading what I wrote the night bef the afternoon of the night before in the morning, and then I go probably late morning after I'm doing chores and stuff and sit someplace by myself. And the cool thing about fiction is I don't need any sources around me. I don't need memos and transcripts. I need my head, my fingers, and the laptop. So I like to sit outside if I can. And I start by going through comments that she's made about what I did yesterday. And then I adjust those comments, adopt them, sometimes resist them, but then talk about them. And then push on and start writing the next part of this. And then that process just repeats until I have a good draft of the whole book. Is there a James Comey figure in this book? No. Originally, yeah. I thought there should be, that, it, that the protagonist would kind of be a young me. And it was so great to switch to that person being inspired by my daughter, because I don't know about other authors, but it's more fun not to write about me. It's more fun to write through her eyes and see the world that I know through her eyes. Much easier and more, and more enjoyable for me. James Comey. Could you have come up with the plot lines in this book without your wife? In your imagination, could you have done this? I think, I suppose so. It would not be nearly as good. I mean, she has an ability because she's read so much fiction and she has so many likes and dislikes about the way in which authors show a story and hide a thing or show a thing that I could come up with a story, but I don't think it would be shown in the same way. She's convinced me that the way it works best for her as a reader is the author decides what to show, has the whole story behind a curtain, and shows pieces of it so that when you get to the end and you, you see the reveal, you say to yourself, ah, that was fair. I missed it, but that was fair. They showed me the things I, if I'd noticed them, I would have picked it up instead of something, a deus ex machina landing from the sky or some false trail that's a manipulation. And so I don't think I could have done anything near that well without my partner. Is Nora Carlton going to be the sequel protagonist? Yes. At the end of the book, you see where Nora's going next. And before I became FBI director, I was three years the general counsel of the world's largest hedge fund in the New York metropolitan area. And so I think there's a whale of a story to be told, a crime story, fictional, in that world because it's a really fascinating world, and also to show readers a little bit about what it's like in a fictionalized sense. So Nora's going to go there, and I don't want to say more about it because it's pretty exciting. And then I'm not going to say a word about the third book because my publisher said we don't want people to know what happens to the characters after the second book. Final question. Are crimes committed 100% of the time for love and money? Not 100% of the time. A lot of the time it is uh, addiction that drives crime, a, a lot, especially violent crime and street crime. A lot of times it's about ego. I, f I need to be seen. I need to be the best. I need to be recognized. And so I will, even though I have tons of money of corporate executive, I need the prominence that comes from being the number one on a particular list. So I have to manipulate my stock or things like that. So I'd say love, money, ego, and substance abuse. This is a really depressing way to end it. James Comey, author of Central Park West, a crime novel. We appreciate your time on Book TV. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Well, thanks for joining us on About Books, a program and a podcast produced by C-SPAN's Book TV. A reminder, coming up, it's our weekly Afterwards program. This week, it's David Bernhardt, the Trump administration interior secretary. He'll discuss the expansion of the U.S. administrative state in recent decades. And a reminder that Book TV will continue to bring you publishing news and author programs. You can find this podcast on our C-SPAN Now app, and you can find all of our programs on our website at booktv.org.